uh, Lydia Schur. Lydia is the founding member of the People's Accords, a nonprofit using modern technology to facilitate a new model for person-to-person -person diplomacy. So everyone, please welcome Lydia Schur. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know if he's here anymore, but he did succeed in making me uncomfortable because um, <laughs> he used my name as the, as the example in his speech. So uh, I'm super honored and excited to be here today. Uh, thank you Meridian for inviting me and our president Tim to be here today. We also have a VR demonstration on the mezzanine level near the entrance if you are interested. And thank you most of all to all the participants in the audience for being present today. So I'd like to start off by knowing a little bit more about who's in the audience. Um, can you raise your hand if you've heard of Web3? Okay, that's that's pretty good. Actually, I, I've been, I'm not new to public speaking and it's, it's interesting to me how many blockchain and metaverse events I've gone to where people actually don't know anything about blockchain or metaverse. So um, I'd like to start by saying that, you know, the truth is Web3 is many things. And um, the Ethereum Foundation describes Web3 as the future of the internet that is focused on individuals rather than corporations. And Harvard Business Review defines it as a blockchain-based future of the internet with NFTs, DAOs, cryptocurrencies, and more. And so I'm here to talk about the and more today. And you know, people like Elon Musk uh, tend to joke about how Web3 is not the solution to Web P to world peace. And even though I drove here in a Tesla, um, I'm going to push back on that idea today a bit and offer some real world solutions for using Web3 technologies to address real world challenges. So there is no single thing that will solve all of the world's problems. However, uh, virtual reality and the metaverse and decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs are built on blockchain can connect people and position them like never before to communicate, collaborate and share ownership and responsibility for solving the world's challenges. And particularly, we believe that this will contribute towards citizen participation and ownership towards reaching the sustainable development goals. So what are some of the applications of Web3 and citizen diplomacy? Uh, as you may know, more than half of the global population today uses social media and has access to the internet. And developments in technology such as virtual reality and real-time language translation have created a historic opportunity for people to communi communicate and cooperate like never before possible. Uh, because traditionally, as you may know, diplomacy has been relegated to the people who are the most wealthy in society that can afford to learn multiple languages, to travel, and often only interact with other elites with the same privileges. Wherein the outcomes of these diplomatic interactions are relayed from the top throughout society and contribute to forming the public opinion about other cultures and people from different societal backgrounds. So what is possible with Web3 and even Web2 to a lesser extent is that we're removing socioeconomic barriers of diplomatic participation for citizens of any nation. And I forgot to mention, I'll be saving a few minutes for questions at the end. So I would I'll be happy to um, have you guys think of some things you would like to ask, and we'll be saving at least five minutes for questions at the end. So technology, as I mentioned, uh, removes the need for travel, but it can also protect the identity and physical safety of those who wish to communicate with others in sensitive or tense diplomatic situations. Uh, situations in which it may not be physically safe for citizens to interact without security being present uh, become less of an issue when using technology and uh, the metaverse in particular is possible for citizens to represent themselves as they would like to be seen uh, without first being perceived by their age, physical ability, uh, skin color or religion, sex, and um, interact without potentially being first perceived by their physical appearance, which is an interesting dynamic that is unique explicitly for uh, online and technological diplomacy. The immersive story sharing experience as well of virtual reality was recently used by the UN Security Council to give members an immersive experience of going through a refugee camp. And this immersive story sharing experience is something that we are building upon in order to generate more empathy among individuals. 
So using technology for citizen diplomacy allows direct interaction with far less repercussions for, and fear of negative consequences in those interactions and giving people opportunities to create familiarity and build empathy for one another without the external negative influences that may be present in certain situations. Um, this is a core component of Web3 citizen diplomacy. But the next one that I really want to talk about is enfranchising communities using blockchain. Blockchain-based community grant programs can allow citizens to propose solutions to challenges that matter to them and democratically decide which proposals will receive funding. Building a community of citizen diplomats who can collectively identify the challenges that matter most to them and their communities, who can submit the proposals for the solutions they think are best, vote on those solutions, and then ultimately receive funding for the solution the community deems the most worthy. We see this as a way to optimize brain power in a society and increase, citizens, increase ownership among citizens for solving societal problems. Some actually might be suspicious of this model as uh, promoting anarchy. However, it is incredibly democratic in the approach to decision making. And furthermore, it's impossible for any one government to address all of a society's needs simultaneously. And this model effectively redistributes financial decision making power to those who need it the most. There is no better way to solve challenges facing communities than to derive solutions internally from the communities themselves. The Web3 Web framework for citizen diplomacy extends the opportunity for leadership to local leaders and enhances the opportunity for grassroots solutions to, that suit the communities that they are designed to serve. So the privileged, wealthy, and highly educated do not have all the answers for no poverty, zero hunger, high quality education, gender equality, clean energy, and more. Each society and each community is unique, and thus the means for attaining a sustainable and comfortable quality of life are also unique for different regions and subregions of the world. This is why I felt compelled to found the citizen, the, the People's Accords, that I saw the Abraham Accords in the Middle East, and I realized that Technology can bring this type of cooperation, not only to governments in the Middle East, but also to people around the world. Our pilot project in Lahore, Pakistan, happening later this year, is being led by more than 100 youth diplomats. And initially we approached these students, asking them for uh, proposal ideas on how to facilitate communication between Muslims and Hindus in the border region. And the students actually pushed back and came back to us with a new request for proposals for addressing the floods in Pakistan. And I felt very encouraged uh, that this is proving that the model of asking communities how to solve the problems and what problems they want to solve is what we are addressing with Web3 citizen diplomacy. There is no better way to solve problems than asking the people who are facing the issues what they want done. So. We're, we're filming a documentary about the pilot project and we're planning to partner with researchers from the Council on Foreign Relations to analyze the success of the project. And assuming that it's successful, uh, we're planning to raise a $100 million endowment to perpetually fund a worldwide citizen diplomacy grants program for building a global citizen diplomatic community and actively uh, have citizens from around the world propose and implement community-driven solutions towards attaining the UN Sustainable Development Goals. I want to finish my speech by actually making it clear that I am among the ivory tower people who can afford to fly all the way to Washington DC and, and be here today. But I'm, I'm actually not here on behalf of myself. I'm really here on behalf of my friends in Gaza and in Israel who have ideas for how the two populations can cooperate economically and to bring uh, more peace and prosperity, but don't have a voice or a way to actually make those ideas a reality. I'm also here on behalf of the young women in India who have developed unique sustainable horticulture practices or chemistry that they don't have an, a means to fund their project or their idea or to communicate it with the outside world. I'm also here on behalf of the students in Pakistan who have ideas about how to prevent floods in their villages and do not have enough means to share and receive funding to implement them. So I would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. And 
I would also encourage you to visit www.peoplesaccords.org um, if you would like to partner with us to participate, ask more questions, or um, cover any topics that we didn't have time to discuss today. So thank you. So great. Uh, is this on? Can <laughs> yeah, I think I can hear it. Okay. But... Well, okay. Uh, great presentation. I guess the question I have is where there are conflicts between people, it makes a lot of sense. But how do you manage the, um, or curate or manage experts, you know, or that are either designated, you know, let's say it's in flooding, you know, people that have knowledge of how flooding can be resolved from their engineering and so forth, and sort of the voices of those that don't have that experience but might be very passionate and loud uh, and might drown out, no pun intended, uh, the experts. So how, how do you manage that? Because we're talking about essentially managing a community or not managing a community and just let it be whatever it becomes. How, how do you uh, do that? So this, this is actually a really good question. Thank you. And we're leaving it in a way to the community where we would assume that the, the people with the best ideas will consult experts. They will understand that they have a good idea, but they aren't experts themselves. And that the people who don't consult experts or don't meet the standards of, of a realistic proposal won't receive funding because there will be a voting process and also a review process from our organization and our board of experts. Currently, um, we have a chief economist, a former chief economist from the World Bank as our uh, on our advisory board, as well as other former diplomats and ambassadors. And we would like to create um, sort of a, a tiered level of, of scanning the proposals that come into us and also leaving it to the community to decide where they can understand if something will work or not. This is a really good question because there's also questions about, um, you know, the blockchain element that could you have a malicious group come and try and overwhelm the system with proposals and take money for illicit projects or something. So we're actively consulting experts to try and uh, mitigate these problems before they occur. So it's a really good question, actually. This is something that, uh, and our president, Tim, is here in the back, and he has a lot of experience um, dealing with community development internationally, which is why, you know, to, to your question, I, I consulted an expert to help lead our board of directors because I, um, you know, I, I live in Israel, and I was, I got the idea from, I was always driving by the West Bank, and I have friends from the UN, from Egypt, and friends in Gaza. And I realized there's so much uh, opportunity for people to, if we would just talk, we would find so many more solutions than if we you know, listen to the news all day and get angry. And um, I'm just very honored to be here and excited about how quickly this organization is growing and how much attention that we've gotten globally so far and just, just since May of this year. So thank you. Other than for um, branding purposes, because it's fashionable, why are you using a blockchain? What's the purpose of that? It doesn't seem to fulfill any need that you have technically or socially. It just makes things more difficult. Do you think so? I mean, because I think in the immediate the future... Of money is the distribution of money by aid agencies is a well practiced activity that doesn't need blockchain. So I might push back slightly on that. And I'll say because in my master's program, I did a study for the Red Cross where they realized they were having such a problem getting funding in time to people and that it would be, let's say a flood happens, but then the money doesn't come for six months. And so you're right. We don't need blockchain to get started. And in fact, we've just hit the ground running with Web 2, Web 1, Web 0. It doesn't actually need blockchain. But as a person who I, I live in multiple countries, that for me, using cryptocurrencies became much easier to manage my finances because I didn't. I could just send things directly to the people I'm working with. And I personally am a believer in blockchain. So maybe it's a personal bias of mine that I think that blockchain allows for a more uh, faster and more efficient financial system that with less middlemen. 
and uh, quicker response times when needed. But there are still security risks for sure that will need to be addressed and talked about um, well before we actually launch um, find funding on blockchain. So I, with that, I think um, if you have any more questions, please come find me and please uh, visit our website. I have LinkedIn and I'm just uh, happy to meet you all today. Thank you so much.